Hey everybody, welcome to Comics with Bueller. As always, I am Bueller, and today I am joined by a comic book writer of a current comic book right now. It's pretty popular. Uh, Gargoyles, Greg Weissman, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I am doing good. I'm actually sitting in the parking lot outside of Cracker Barrel in uh, Denver, <laughs> Colorado. And after this, I'm heading to Boulder, Colorado, because there's some comic shops up there. But uh, I've been sitting here. I slept here overnight. It's a nice place to stay. If anyone needs a place to stay on the road, Cracker Barrel parking lots are great. Um, but you're not only the writer of Gargoyles. You are the creator of Gargoyles. You have a long history with this title. I do. I'm. Uh, I dress for the occasion. I uh, the world premiere was in 1994, uh, nice. and uh, I uh, created the animated series uh, with my development team for Disney, and I was the uh, showrunner on uh, co-showrunner with Frank Parr on the first two seasons, um, and uh, it's kind of been my baby from day one and and i'm glad to be back doing it again that's awesome so how did that come to be how did, obviously dynamite uh, they got the license from disney to put these out they got a few different disney licenses right now how did this come back to be and you find yourself back writing these characters that you created i mean was a phone call made to you or are you, you to them or how did that come up to be uh the editor of the book uh nate cosby uh contacted me uh, through a buddy um, we hadn't known each other before uh, now we know each other pretty well but um, we were strangers initially but uh, you know he contacted me and asked me if I would be interested in uh, writing some gargoyles comics and I was a thrilled that I was asked because yeah. I don't think that's a given uh, I may have created the show, but I uh, don't own it in any way. Disney owns it, and uh, um, so it's not a it's not automatic that um, people come to me for it. Uh, but I was thrilled that he did, and so you know, I immediately said yes, and uh, um, and and here we are. There you go. So you got a monthly comic book coming out, but you've you've written this book before. You they. Didn't, did you not write another volume of Gargoyles comics a few years back? Yeah, uh, I actually going even further back while the show was on the air, Marvel had the license for a while. And um, we don't consider those comics canon because uh, I was busy making the show and they were off on their own doing their thing without uh, a lot of uh, consultation from those of us making the show. Um but there came a point where I was about to take over the, the writing of that book, the Marvel book. And I actually wrote one script uh, for it. Um, and then the book got canceled. And then uh, around 2006, 2007, I partnered with uh, SLG Publishing. And we did uh, 12 issues of Gargoyles and six issues of a Gargoyle spinoff called Bad Guys. Um, and they were, and I got to use that one script uh, that Marvel never used. Uh, but I also uh, obviously wrote 17 other stories as well. But uh, um, they, uh, uh, that book was SLG's best selling title at the time, but SLG lost the license. And so we were done. And uh, I've been trying to get back to writing Gargoyles comics ever since and and i've been trying to get the show back on the air and all sorts of things but finally dynamite came to me which was wonderful and uh and we're back in business we've got gargoyles going strong um issue five just i, mean, we're, I don't know when this will be released but when we recorded this uh issue five just came out issue six due out later this month um and then uh we've got a new mini series gargoyles the dark ages that is coming out oh, nice. this summer um or starting this summer and uh that's a prequel series set in uh the year 971 which is even before the pilot of the original television uh show and so it tells the story of the original alliance between gargoyles and humans in, and you're writing uh, that in well. scotland and i'm writing that with drew moss doing the art very nice. 
Uh, you mentioned canon. I want to get to that a little bit because that was actually one of my questions. So the Marvel run, that wouldn't be considered canon, correct? No. I mean, a lot of fun stories, but um, a lot of things that are don't quite fit in our universe. And, and sure. uh, I mean, uh, again, all praise for the people who worked on it. It's just that we were off doing the show over here. They were off doing a Marvel book over here. And, uh, and they didn't, they don't quite match up. Um, mm -hmm. and so we don't, uh, consider that canon, but the SLG run, we consider canon and the run for dynamite is canon to the series. Okay. Um, and SLG picks up right where season two of gargoyles left off and, uh, the dynamite run picks up pretty much like, I don't know, a month after the SLG run ended and, uh, and so it, we're set in 1997 in the main series and 971 in the spinoff series. And uh, we're having a good time. I'm having a good time anyway. So I know that the the Gargoyles series did not run for three seasons. I, th I think you left after the second season, correct? Yeah, Gargoyles ran for two seasons. Then they did uh, a show called The Goliath Chronicles. Okay, that's, yeah. For a third season. And again, almost all the behind the scenes i mean the voice talent is still there and they're great um but almost all the behind the scenes uh talent had left the show by the time it got a pickup um and abc had very specific so the first two seasons were done in syndication uh and we got a, we had a lot of freedom honestly we did um and then the third season uh, Goliath Chronicles was done for ABC and they had considerably less freedom um, in terms of what ABC did and didn't want to show. They required these sort of moralizing prologue and epilogue uh, monologues from Goliath. They uh, changed the main title uh, and there were again a lot of really talented people. Um, some of them are friends of mine who worked on uh, Goliath Chronicles, but the characters kind of, you know, the, the people in charge um, had a very tight schedule and did not have time to acclimate themselves to the series. And so there are a lot of characters just behaving out of character, a lot of things that we would not have done on the show. And so again, we don't consider that Goliath Chronicles canon. So the Marvel stuff, the Goliath Chronicles stuff, Disney Adventures published in their little digest books, a few sort of kids stories which again fun but not really the tone of the show not really canon to the show so for us canon there's the first two seasons the slg run of 18 issues and the dynamite run there you go well, that's awesome let me ask you this what was it like uh pitching this original idea to disney i mean um <laughs> Uh, that had to be a little nerve wracking. I know you're, you're, this was quite a long time ago. I'm assuming we're probably similar in age. So you were quite a bit younger back then. Um, were you, were you I nervous? Was, was the initial reaction positive or was there a lot of uh, question marks involved? I was, I don't know that I was that nervous uh, because by that time I had been, where I was an executive at Disney. Um, uh, director of series development at the time. And uh, we came up with the idea in 91 um, and had been working on it, developing it for quite some time. But the origin of the idea was not the show that you know. Um, there was a show that Disney had called Disney's Adventures of the Gummy Bears, um, which we loved. I loved. It was created by a guy named Jim Magon. And it had this rich medieval backstory and it, it was funny and all this great action and great villains. I mean, it was comedic. Um, I and have I that. actually watched that show. So, I mean, I, I know yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> well, we loved it and we felt it didn't get, and it was original too. It wasn't based on anything. And we felt it didn't get the respect that it deserved. Um in largely because there was brand confusion with another show called Care Bears. Um, and Care Bears to me was a sort of saccharine sweet show about um, hugs. Um, and, but we were the one named after a candy. Yeah. So <laughs> I understood the confusion. They both had multicolored cute little bears. Um, but, 
but Gummy Bears was a comedy adventure show. And so we set out to create a show that was like that, but would have more respect. And it was the 90s and the big buzzword in the 90s, I'm sure you recall, was edgy. Everything had to be edgy, right? Um, so we did two things in particular to make it edgy. We still had this great medieval backstory, but we decided to put our characters to sleep for a thousand years, wake them up in modern day Manhattan because that was edgier. And then instead of them being cute little multicolored bears, we had cute little multicolored gargoyles um, instead. And But it was a comedy adventure show. Uh, and we, I personally, I pitched it to Michael Eisner, who at the time was chairman of the Walt Disney Company sort of the last of the Hollywood moguls. And he chose all the series. I mean, mm. It wasn't like today when every decision is made by committee. Uh, Michael personally chose every single series that we produced. And by that time, I had uh, been pitching to Michael, you know, every six months, um, I'd pitch him six or seven shows, eight or nine shows. Um, and, you know, he'd kill most of them. Uh, most of the pitches, but every, but he, we had the Disney afternoon. And so he knew he had to pick something. And so he would pick one. And, and in those days, if, if Michael Eisner, the head of the company picked the show, everyone got on board or got out of the way. Um, and we were able to just go make it. So the first time I pitched Gargoyles as this comedy adventure show, he passed on it. Um, so I walked away uh, bummed, but uh, that was the way things were back then. But my boss said to me, there's still something in this show. I like this show. Uh, keep working on it. So I showed the pitch to a few people who had not worked on it at Disney um, just to get feedback on it. Like, what do you think? And one of the people I showed it to was a guy named Tad Stones, who had created Chippendale's Rescue Rangers and Darkwing Duck. Darkwing is another dynamite title right now. Um, and he suggested, he had actually seen um, an early uh, version of Beauty and the Beast. Mm. And so he said, and you've got all these cute little gargoyles. Why don't you ditch all of them and have one big gargoyle instead with a f female, you know, uh, human hero. And you can do sort of a Beauty and the Beast kind of thing. And that just sort of really resonated with me. I, my background wasn't in funny animals and comedy. My background was in comic books and uh, that genre and superheroes. And I decided, okay, what if we did this as sort of a backdoor superhero show? No capes, no tights, you know, but that's the genre we're going to be in. Um, and uh, I worked with an artist named Greg Guler, and we created the character Goliath, who had not existed in the comedy development. Almost all the other major characters had existed, but in a sillier, yeah. more comedic kind of form. And so we took all those characters and put them through the prism of Goliath and came out the other end with uh, the show that you guys know, um, yeah. this action drama instead of a comedy adventure. And um, we got very excited about this and we got had all these ideas and we put together this really huge long pitch for it and we took it to eisner six months after the first pitch and um we pitched it to him and he killed it he didn't like it um <laughs> uh, and so uh the next day we had a meeting uh my bosses my immediate bosses and i uh guys named uh, gary kreisel and bruce cranston had a meeting with jeffrey katzenberg who was chairman of the Walt Disney studio at the time. So Eisner was head of the whole company. Katzenberg was head of the studio. And we were talking about whichever show, because Michael had bought something and I can't quite in my memory, it's, you know, it's been 30 years. Um, remember which pitch it was that Gargoyles, the second version of Gargoyles got killed. So it was either Goof Troop or Bonkers. One, but he had bought something that day because he always bought one thing. Killed everything else but bought one thing. Um, and so we were mostly talking about, you know, the show that Michael had bought and what were the next steps and et cetera. And then we're standing up to go and, and Jeffrey turns to me and says, uh, and you're going to keep working on Gargoyles, right? And I sort of looked around and I said to him, well, no. <laughs> um, yeah. We pitched it as a comedy, 
He didn't like it. We pitched it as a drama. He didn't like it. I don't know what else we, he's like, Oh no, it's not that he didn't like it. Uh, it's that he thought it needed more work. Well, that had, I'd had been there the day before. It's yeah, not like yeah. I, he hadn't said that. No, but what said, became yeah. clear to me was that Jeffrey liked it. Yes. And, um, he wasn't gonna, in those days, Jeffrey and Michael were tight, you know, later they kind of went to war with each other, but in those days they were tight and he wasn't gonna sort of in front of his boss say, no, you're wrong or anything like that, but he liked it. And so we went back to the drawing board a third time and we looked at the show and we decided there's nothing wrong with this show. This show fucking rocks. Yeah. Um, the problem was the pitch. We had gotten so excited. We had put all the stuff in the pitch all stuff that we ended up doing in the show, but it was overwhelming and distracting. And so we added nothing to the pitch. We just kept cutting things away and focused it on the story of Goliath, the main gargoyle and Elisa, the human cop who befriends him. And thus it became more of a beauty and the beast kind of pitch. So six months after that, which was one year after the original comedy pitch um we came back and pitched uh gargoyles for a third time um and by that time beauty and the beast had come out and you know it was kind of a kind of a hit for the disney company <laughs> um and uh he took a look at it and he bought it right away uh yeah. and became a big champion of the series in the company uh, michael did and jeffrey did as well um and so we set out to make it but it was not easy to get it through it took three pitches it took us uh two years uh to uh get this thing going and uh but we finally did and then like i said everything that we had done in the second pitch that we had cut out yeah. we put into the show it was good stuff for the show it had just made the pitch distracting and he couldn't focus on what's the, the thing really about and by cutting it down we were able to focus him and then he liked it well thank you for sticking to it because i mean you a lot of fans of this series so i appreciate that um i did um, see there's a video of you online doing the pitch which is that the comedy pitch you, you, I, i'm assuming you know what i'm talking about because i think you put the video out uh, i didn't put it out but uh it was on the uh so uh, after we'd sold the show internally, it was a syndicated show. We had to sell it to stations okay. all across the nation. And we went to a convention called NATPE, N-A-T-P-E, which stood for something like the National Alliance of Television Pro Producers and Executives or something like that. Um, and... Uh, I pitched that show to uh, individual stations like, you know, over a three or four day period, something like 12 times per day. And they had a giant life-size statue of Goliath in life-size, like eight feet tall with a, with a 10 foot wingspan. It was insane. That's I have photos of me with it, but I have no idea what happened to that statue. I'd love to know what happened to that statue. So if any of your, uh, uh, viewers know what happened to that statue. Please let me know. You can have, um, one, have one commission, man. You could you could do it now. Get one of your very own. Yeah, I'm sure my wife would love that. <laughs> right. Uh, no, on top but, of the house. Uh, on top of the I, house. I even doing that many pitches over the weekend. There was no way to get to every station, so they recorded me doing that pitch. Um, at my office at Disney. Um, I, I mean, I remember all sorts of weird little details about that recording among them that I had worn a white shirt to work. And they're like, you can't record wearing white, you know? Um, I'm like, well, you want me? And so I borrowed a shirt from a secretary um, who, uh, a woman named Kim Mozingo, uh, lent me her shirt so I could wear a blue shirt instead of a white shirt. Um, and uh, and then they took that video and they put it on the season one DVD mm. as an extra. Uh, so whoever put it on the internet, I'm sure just 
plucked it off yeah. that DVD and, and put it up there. Well, it's a great pitch. I, I, if anyone just go search uh, your name and it pops right up and it's the pitch for, uh, for yeah. gargoyles. So I, it's a lot of fun. So. It's interesting because on the DVD, the DVD was made 10 years after the show. So I'm like 40 on the DVD and, uh, but 30 in the pitch and, you know, now I'm almost 60. So, yeah. uh, uh, I, you know, if I show that pitch at, at conventions with, and, you know, I haven't done a lot of conventions, sure. there was this pandemic thing. I don't know if you heard about it, but, uh, it sort of yeah. interrupted my convention going for a bit, but, uh, I used to do gargoyles panels and show this at conventions. And it was sort of like, you know, you see me now, and then you see me introducing the thing at age 40 on the DVD. And then you see the actual pitch where I'm 30. And it's sort of like um, the picture of Dorian Gray in reverse. Um, yeah. <laughs> I keep getting older, but I stay young on the video. <laughs> hey, it's history. It's history right there. Um, <laughs> can we uh, kind of switch gears? I want to talk about the amazing voice cast that was on the TV series. And I got to mm -hmm. ask the first time you heard, um, I believe it was a Keith, uh, Keith David mm -hmm. as Goliath. What was that? Cause that's iconic. I mean, that's just, you, you must, when you write these stories now, you probably hear that voice in your head. Uh, I, I hear, absolutely hear all the I voices. I hear. Hear. Yeah. What was it like um, the first time? What well, was like, okay, that glove fits. That's perfect. We had uh, cast the entire show except for two characters, Goliath and Elisa, our two leads. Um, and uh, we had this phenomenal cast of regulars, but we could not find the right Goliath and Elisa. And in fact, at one point, I just thought, okay, we're not going to find them. But these, we, we picked one of each and we took it to our boss, and Gary Kreisel, and, and said, I think this is, these are the two we should pick. And he listened to me, said, you're settling. And my response was, no, no, these are great. But he was right. <laughs> and he said, no, no, you're settling. Keep looking. Uh, and then uh, our voice and casting director, Jamie Thomason, um, came up to me and said, I think I may have found the guy. And he says, his name's Keith David. Now, there's another actor named David Keith. And I confused the two uh and david <laughs> keith uh uh is a great actor i've loved him in a lot of stuff but he's total i mean he's uh southern and he, he's yeah. uh uh you know totally wrong for goliath <laughs> and i was like fun. you're crazy and and then it became clear that we were talking about two different people i said oh okay david uh, keith keith david who's keith david and he said well he was in they uh live yeah. and uh, i was like wait was he the guy in the 10 minute fight scene? Uh, this fight with Roddy Roddy Piper. He's like, yeah, that's one. I'm like, oh, yeah, let's hear that. So, and then you're right. I mean, the minute we heard Keith, we were like, that's the guy. That, that's Goliath. We knew it instantaneously. Jamie knew it first because yeah. he heard him first. But uh, the moment he played him for me, I'm like, oh my God, that's the guy. Wow. And um, Keith is uh, a friend now. And, uh, you know, is a remarkable, obviously, uh, performer um, on everything he does. But uh, Goliath, I know, is one of his favorite roles ever. Uh, and uh, uh, he's always been a big, huge supporter of the show. And, and he loves it uh, as much as the rest of us do. He really does. Oh, yeah. And uh, honestly, I, Jonathan Franks being uh, uh, is it Xanatos? Xanatos, yes. Um, you know, do you have a love of Star Trek? Because there's a lot of Star Trek uh, <laughs> actors to do. I do have a love of Star Trek. Uh, I'm definitely a fan. Um, but the, and so everyone assumes that's why, but that isn't why we have so many Star Trek <laughs> actors. The fact of the matter is, is that the very first person to audition for anything, you know, because we held auditions for, I don't know, like nine regulars. Um, and we didn't audition after that. You know, in other words, once we'd cast our regulars, uh, we didn't keep holding auditions. When we had guest characters, we just cast them. There wasn't time to hold auditions for every role that came about. 
But for our first set of auditions, um, the first person to walk through the door was Marina Sirtis, mm -hmm. uh, who plays counselor Deanna Troy on yeah. um, uh, Star generation. Trek The Next Generation. And uh, she auditioned for Elisa, and she wasn't right for Elisa, but we thought, you know, she might be good for Demona, but we didn't have, as Marina loves to remind me, we didn't have the uh, the copy ready for Demona, the audition copy for her to read. So we had to ask her to come back. Um, and so we did, and she was the first person to read for Demona as well. And she was fantastic, but we'd scheduled a bunch of other Demona auditions for the day. So we couldn't tell her that second, but because, uh, you know, you never know, I suppose, but we pretty much knew. And, and so we cast Marina as Demona. And then uh, Jonathan uh, got cast uh, as Xanatos. Um, and so then you've got these two Star Trek actors in the booth every week, right? Yeah. Um, and I'd be in there with Jamie Thomason and Jamie would go, okay, what are the guest characters for next week? So I can get working on casting them and i would be like and just as an example i'd be like well we've got goliath's brother coming in so we need someone who's got big deep chops like pete has so that he can play opposite his brother and um and you know and we're saying this during a break of of the recording so you know you look through the glass and you see jonathan marina sitting in there chatting you know and i'm like well what about michael dorn um and it wasn't like let me try to get more Star Trek actors. It's just, you know, you're trying to think of someone who fits the bill, sure. right? Sure. And uh, and there are these Star Trek actors sitting through the glass there. And so that, you know, so we got LeVar Burton and we got uh, uh, Brent Spiner and we got Kate Mulgrew and um, Avery Brooks and... <laughs> Uh, Nichelle Nichols uh, nice. and at some point I think it was like oh we got Nichelle uh, to play Elisa's mom she was wonderful just wonderful yeah. um, and I'm like can we get someone from every Star Trek show I mean and we never because it was just fun and we never yeah. sort of would have cast anyone who was wrong for a role just to get a Star Trek actor in there sure. but you know it's a great <laughs> ensemble of people who have worked in Star Trek. And, uh, and so we, it wasn't hard. And then at some point, I think the publicity value of it um, got our publicity people all excited as well. Um, and so, you know, it didn't hurt. So we kept at it. Uh, we didn't work to not use Star Trek actors um, because, oh no, we've done too many, none of that stuff, right? Uh, uh, it, they, there was just this, and at the time, Next Generation was still in production. Uh, at the you know at the end of their run, and and DS Nine was going, and Voyager was, excuse me, just starting up. <coughs> so, just over the hill at Paramount, there was this, this fantastic ensemble of actors that we took advantage of, and and you had. Breaks and Sirius there to sort of say it's a good gig. The writing's yeah. good. You don't have to memorize the scripts. There's no four hours of makeup, um, Michael <laughs> Dorn, that you have to sit through beforehand. You can come in in your pajamas if you want to. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, and so you know, for them, it was a, a fun sort of side gig. Um, and uh, again, we're all uh, grateful that they all yeah. said yes. Well, I can't think of another uh, uh, animated series with this caliber of uh, voice actors on it and just memorable voice actors for Goliath, for Xanatos, for all the different characters. Just amazing. Um, but speaking of voice acting, you've been involved with a lot of other projects. I mean, you're not just you're not just the Gargoyles guy. You've been an executive producer, a producer of many things like uh, Star Wars Rebels, um, a spectacular Spider-Man young justice now you've done a little voice acting yourself i noticed correct yeah. Yeah. is that just I, you there's one up? producer who loves my acting work so much that he cast me in every show that it's that some guy named greg weissman always cast me <laughs> um 
Yeah, I mean, I'm a SAG member, and uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm very careful to not take a role that uh, I can't handle as an actor. You know, uh, I I play a stormtrooper in Star Wars yeah. Rebels. You know, I mean, I play the uh, button down assistant to Norman Osborn in Spectacular Spider-Man. Um, I play a talking gorilla uh, and a goofy sidekick in uh, um, Young Justice. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, um, you know, it, they're all relatively uh, easy parts, but I do have a fun time doing it. I've done a little, a little bit of voice acting for uh, other people. Um, I've done some anime and um, and I just get a kick out of it. It's fun. It's not what I do for a living, but I do enjoy it. And, um, so it's kind of that Hitchcock thing. You know, I put myself yeah. into, uh, uh, all of my shows. I, I even played, uh, a commando in gargoyles with one line, uh, oh, nice. and, uh, going even further back, I played a panda bear in tailspin. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's just you putting your stamp on it right there. That way people know that's my voice. I'm in there. And I did it when I was wearing my pajamas and that's all it was. Right? Well, no, I probably was wearing Gargoyle's <laughs> t-shirt because all I own are Gargoyle's t-shirts. So. That's all. That's not a bad wardrobe at all. Um, let's go ahead and get back to the uh, dynamite book. That's out right now. It comes out every month. I think, like you said, I think issue five just came out. Issue six is next on the horizon. Um, what can we be looking at as far as story wise? Are you, I know Gargoyles is a licensed product from Disney. Do you have the freedom to create new characters, uh, for this? Universe? Yeah, I, I have. Um, I mean, uh, the good news is, is that, you know, there's no one at Disney that knows Gargoyles better than I am. So when it comes to the storytelling and characters, uh, Disney and Dynamite have given me quite a bit of freedom. Um, and, uh, so we created a new villain, Dino Dracon, uh, who is this mobster uh, who's trying to take over the New York uh, underworld um, and other uh, characters as well. Um, we're basically in the middle now uh, of a 12 issue arc called Here in Manhattan. Uh, issue seven uh, finally brings back Demona, uh, who uh, has been absent for the first uh six issues um we've seen her in a couple quick flashback scenes but now she's back and getting involved in all this um and plotting her own future uh plots um and uh goliath has been uh arrested by uh the city and is being held at rikers island um mm. and uh is scheduled to in essence, there's going to be a hearing to decide whether or not a gargoyle has any human rights. Um, and uh, he had the opportunity to escape, but he passed on it um, and uh, decided that once and for all, they needed to answer that question. You know, were, is it possible for humans and gargoyles to live in peace together? And he's decided to test that. Um, and... Uh, so uh, we have all that going on in here in Manhattan in the main book, um, sure. which is drawn by George Cambadeus, who just does amazing stuff month after month in the book. And um, then in the spinoff, which starts uh, early this summer, uh, we've got, we're going back to 971, back when Hudson was the head of the clan and Goliath was just a young warrior and, he and Demona were teenagers in love, and um, and we're seeing the origins of the Gargoyles Human Alliance, seeing how it came to be, and and whether or not it can survive. <coughs> Very nice, Greg. I want to say thank you so much for coming on and uh, you know talking about one of my. Well, I wasn't too much of a child; I was in my teenage years. But this, honestly, the Gargoyles for me was like. I was a teenager, but this was like the only cartoon I was watching. And at the time, still, I still enjoyed, I still wanted to watch cartoons, but I felt so, oh, they're a little too kiddish for me. But Gargoyles, 
I can pull the switch on that one, not a problem. So I want to say thank you for bringing this lovely universe to life and all these great characters. And now we get to enjoy it again. I get to share it with uh, my kids and stuff so they get to see it. They get to watch Disney Plus, and I believe they have all the episodes now on they Disney do, Plus yeah. were not available for the longest time. I think there was big, huge gaps between when they released them as far as on DVDs and stuff like that. So the whole universe is available to consume right now, which is just fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I it, it's a big thrill for me. I love it. I love that it's available. People can watch the show. I love that we're doing these books and people can read those either, you know, have the... You know, have the hard copies in your hand, or uh, uh, or get them electronically. Um, uh, it it you know it really is. It sounds like a cliche, but for me, it really is like a dream come true that this property that means so much to me and so personal to me is yeah. is coming back in so many ways. There are new toys from NECA and uh, oh, and other companies, Funko and others, and uh, it's just. Uh, great you know uh i i'm i'm glad that the 90s nostalgia wave has sort of reached gargoyles and pulled us pulled us along with the tide there you go well greg before we go is there anything you'd like to say to our gargoyle fans out there uh we live again (laughs) so um yeah just keep you know please uh if we want to keep these stories going uh, by gargoyles, by gargoyles, the dark ages. Um, you know, that's what keeps it going. It's it's a vote with your wallet is really what it comes down to. You know, it, that's how we keep the book going. The sales stay high. They'll keep making them. It's that simple. Nice. Well, Greg, thank you very much. And I want to thank everyone watching here today. Go out, buy gargoyles, put it on your pull list at your local comic shop or whatever. Yeah, you Pre-ordering and pull list. That's really what there you go. What matters. And there are a ton of awesome covers to choose from. So there's something for everybody. I mean, this is Perillo doing gargoyle. Get a break. I mean, look at that. I've never seen a gargoyle look like that before. So that's pretty awesome. So there you go. But anyway, thank you, Greg, once again for coming on. And uh thank Thanks you everyone for, for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You know what to do. And don't forget to live your best life. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.